Okay, it's seven o'clock. Very much. So. Uh, we'll call the the meeting of the Conway Board of Selectmen to order uh, on this the uh, the eighth of August. Uh, our meeting is be, being recorded by uh, Frontier Community Access Television and can be viewed on demand after it's edited. Okay, first thing on our uh, agenda is the minutes for July, the July 25th meeting. Uh, I was not at that meeting, so I have to abstain. Okay, I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the minutes. So uh, second. All in favor? I'll say aye. Unanimous. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, next item on the agenda, we have a vendor warrant for $39,862, a payroll warrant of $98,621, and a payroll deduction warrant of $26,056. I'll make a motion that we accept those warrants. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, any meetings attended by select board members since uh, our last board meeting? Uh, Tom and I had a meeting this past week uh, with uh, Joe Stukowski and a couple of men, uh, Pixie Holbrook. We had uh, were made aware that there's a possibly a parcel of land that may be coming on the market right near the center of town. There's a fair amount of acreage with it. Mm -hmm. So we went out and looked at that. Uh, no comments on it yet because there's nothing hard fast or anything to say about it, but it's, it's Pretty good lot for certain things you could use for Tom. Good. But uh, as far as that went, so far I guess Tom, right? Is that what you think? Yeah, I think it'll probably be most useful to housing if if uh, they're willing to consider it. Kind that of a great a spot for senior use. housing. Mm. It really would be. Okay. And but it's an expandable lot, I'd say. They could they could expand on it if they wanted to, I think. Okay. Well, about a week ago, there was a planning board meeting. You, you came, you went, and I went, and, and Tom went, mm -hmm. uh, looking at land use, just mm -hmm. trying to gather all the information for all the projects that want to use open space. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, all right, any citizens' concerns? Hearing none, we'll go on to old business. Uh, first item is to appoint uh, Melissa Patterson to the Open Space Committee. Uh, Tom, she comes recommended by the Open Space Committee? Yes. Okay. Yes, we were going to uh, appoint her before, and she wasn't, she was supposed to come in tonight, and I did not send her a reminder. Okay. And she's not here. All right, so, so her term would end uh, the end of... Uh, uh, the fiscal year uh, two, 2000. Does any of us know her? Do you know her, John? Uh, I, I don't know. No. I don't know. Mom doesn't know her She comes recommended, though, by the Open Space. Yes, Committee. and you did get her bio. Yeah, her uh, bio. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Last time. Okay. Just like to, you know, see face to face what she looks like, mm -hmm. you know, before you. Yeah, just ask her to come in, Tom, and yeah. introduce herself. Uh, all right, I'll make a motion that we. Um, uh, based on the recommendation of the Open Space Committee that we appoint uh, Melissa Patterson to the committee for a term ending uh, June 30th, 2017. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, next item on our agenda is new business. We have a presentation by Diane Jensen Olszewski, is that correct? Correct. Okay, on, on Save Our Public Schools Initiative. You have the floor, Diane. I'd like to thank you for making time for me to come and speak about this. I have spoken previously at a number of school committee meetings and uh, five of the six that I did attend unanimously uh, supported a resolution to keep the cap on charter schools. Um, I'd like to just introduce myself first and then I have a couple of opening remarks, but mm -hmm. I am a parent. I'm a retired educator. I taught in the city of Chicopee for 35 years and I work part-time now for Mass Teachers Association as a Senate District Coordinator in Rosenberg's district. So, mm -hmm. um, and I have sort of the northern tier of that turf. So I go and talk to legislators about 
issues that affect public education and even higher education. Um, and so I really care about this issue because it's what I did for my whole career and I was a special education teacher and, and I worked with a lot of disadvantaged families. And, and I want to also say before I talk about the ballot question that uh, you know, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it is and I just want to say that it's not about demonizing parents for making choices for their kids or nor does it affect any of the existing charter schools that are here now. And we are not at the cap now. We haven't met the cap yet. Um, if it were to pass, we would get 12 new schools each year, which does not sound like a lot, but that's written into perpetuity. So we have the potential to have literally hundreds more. Right now in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts we're losing over $413 million a year that comes out of the public school budgets and goes to the charter schools with no accountability because they don't have elected boards. Mm -hmm. um, and so there have been some places like Brockton where the city council and the school board unanimously said we don't want the school here but the Department of Ed gets the final say on it. So it's there. They so have the, a school so, they didn't want. And so the Department of Education overruled they get to decide. the city council they get on to. placing a school in Brockton. Right. And the way the, the way the law has been going, the underperforming districts are the ones where charters could come in first. If this cap gets lifted, they can go anywhere. So communities that were more preferred or affluent communities that have previously pretty much been immune to this phenomenon, like places like Wellesley, are going to end up having these boutique charter schools that have specialized things and they're going to begin to feel what the public schools in urban areas and the rural, di rural districts who get hammered because they don't have a big budget to begin with. Right. So, and the other thing is that most of the superintendents of schools and school committees and elected folks get it. They're all on the same page. It's not, mm -hmm. this is a broad coalition of people that, that, that are trying to keep the cap because we care about the future of public education. And, and I, I care that there's no local control because those are my tax dollars and I think that that should be something that all citizens in the Commonwealth care about. It's, it's a nonpartisan issue, right? Where do, where's my tax dollars go? Um, so that's a big issue. Um, uh, there was some legislation that Rosenberg tried to get through recently. I, I don't think it would have gotten through the House. And, and there were some very good things in it about um, getting more accountability measures because originally charters were supposed to share their best practices. Well, we have yet to see that. That has not happened. So 96% um, of our students in the Commonwealth go to charter schools. I mean, go to public school. 4% go to charters. Uh, and they use a lot more per pupil money in those schools. Uh, we take everybody in the public schools. I can attest to that because my job was early childhood special needs kids. We get them at three, and every year I got kids with diverse needs. Um, we, we have to take preschool through high school. The charters can limit, can decide which grades they're enrolling. They don't take preschool. They, they take a very limited number of the special needs kids, particularly kids that have any multiple needs. Mm -hmm. And frequently parents are counseled by them to, then they'll say things like, you know, you'd be better served in the public sector, you know. So that's how they keep them out. Yeah, yeah, and they, because they need the staff. They need PTs and OTs and speech right. pathologists and all those people that cost money that we have to pay for. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my job, so I, I know about that in a very personal way. Um, the other, the other group that they largely underserve are the English language learners, which we all know are a growing mm -hmm. number of students in our public schools. Mm -hmm. um, so they essentially take the kids that are the least expensive to educate, and so they have sort of a skewed profile already. Sure. Sure. Uh, in Northampton, they just determined that for the 200 students that go out to charters in their district, they're spending $2.2 .2 million on those kids. They also mm -hmm. determined that most of the incomes of those parents are over $100,000 a year, and most of them have at least one degree. Some have multiple degrees. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not what the charters are saying, which is that they're serving these marginalized, underprivileged kids. And in fact, the NAACP now has signed a huge n national resolution about this because of the civil rights there. They're saying the schools in the urban areas are more segregated than ever now. 
Um, the, the other aspect of charters is accessibility. I worked with a lot of poor families, many of whom did not have a vehicle, and so they would not even be able to access a charter school if they wanted to because they're working three jobs and they don't have a vehicle and it's just not a viable option. I take care of three kids in Hatfield that go to a charter school, so I'm there a lot and I see taxi cabs picking up and dropping off kids. So yeah. I know that the parents that I worked with would certainly not have those kinds of resources. So I, I really care about this because I think that we need to preserve public education in the Commonwealth where it was created by Horace Mann and John Adams. Uh, and we need to have an accessible quality public school for all students, not just for a select few. And I'm all for choice and innovation. I, I, I wish that our public schools could allow and empower teachers to, especially veteran, solid teachers, to innovate and share those best practices. But we could do that in the public school if we had resources. We have mm -hmm. an old foundation budget, as you know, from 1993 that doesn't adequately fund. Um, and and the charters are constantly talking about waiting lists. We have a waiting list in the Commonwealth right now of 14,500 preschoolers that can't get into a preschool. We also have many, many districts that can't afford an all-day kindergarten. So we have a really separate and unequal system already where kids are entering first grade and they're not at a level playing field because communities can't fund that or parents have to pay or there's a lottery system. And that's not how it should be in public school. It should be a level playing field. Mm -hmm. So we are urging, and I put a sample resolution in your packet, and I put the, the depressing yeah. packet about how much each district mm -hmm. is losing. And mm -hmm. you know, my son's high school frontier lost $500,000 this year. So I didn't know how to find that data in here. So Fr Frontier's could, in the so, back. Oh, the, oh, a lot oh. of the regional schools uh, are in the I back. I see. Um, the, the other thing to know, about charter schools is that they can hire non-certified teachers. They have a turnover rate of staff that's twice that of the public schools, which is not good for students. They hire a lot of younger, inexperienced teachers, and they can they hire Teach for America kids, which yeah. it's great for them because they get a break on their college loan, but they have five weeks of training to teach the students that they teach. Yeah. So. You know, I, there is no data right now to show that charters are doing this exceptionally better thing than public schools do because we can't get the data. And I did put, it's not part of the, the Save Our Public Schools campaign, but there is a letter in there that Suzanne Bump wrote to the Joint Committee on Education, the House mm -hmm. and the Senate, where, and she's the garter of the money, and she's saying we don't have adequate data, the methodology is poor. There's not enough of it. There's not enough from enough schools for us to determine anything. So how are we going to spend more of the taxpayers' dollars when we don't know now where the money's going? So, um, so essentially what's happening is that the charter schools have a private school criteria and are being funded with public funds. Yeah, and we don't even really know what their, you know, what their efficacy is because we can't mm -hmm. get data. We've had to actually sue them. There are about five or six lawsuits in the Commonwealth in the past couple of years mm -hmm. to get the public records from the schools that are public. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's really worrisome to me as a taxpayer. You know, and I think, why would they be afraid of accountability measures and being more transparent if there were no issue with it? If there's no issue with it and everything's above board, put it out there, just like this meeting, right? So, I, I think because there is an issue, because it, it's a separate and unequal system. And to me, I liken it to the Jim Crow South, because no one here in this room is going to raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm for that system. That looks really fair to me. Well, this is the same thing. It's creating separate and unequal schools. Mm -hmm. And many of our kids don't have access to them. And it's still a lottery system, and it's not thinking big. The big picture is we have to adequately fund public education because it's the great equalizer. This is what I know as a teacher. I've had kids in my class born at 26 weeks, many of whom have graduated from college now. So I know not to count anybody's kid out. Mm -hmm. That's the job I did. So I think that that opportunity should be available for all kids, uh, and I urge you all to vote no, and I would love it if you would consider a resolution, because I, 
I think that if this passes here and the people that are behind it are the Koch brothers, the Waltons, Foundation, Freedom Works, and on and on, on, hedge fund billionaires from the Upper East Side of Manhattan who don't send their kids to public school, and they figured out a way to hijack our dollars. And so we need to get more accountability. You know, I'm all for having innovative schools. I would love that. I'm, mm -hmm. I was a teacher. <laughs> but we need to have some... Ground rules. Some yeah. rules. This information that you gave us on the, on the shortfall, where did this data come from? That is that I got from the MTA, but I, I believe that there are multiple groups that have, have published that. Also, the League of Women Voters in Northampton has been studying this for a long, long time, and they created a kind of a flow chart that showed they just chose Northampton because the funding formula for charter schools is mm -hmm. so convoluted and crazy that they just wanted to see kind of where their money went in Northampton, and what what it ended up showing was a about an $11,000 difference between the per pupil money that the public school kids got and the charter school kids mm. got. So that's pretty outrageous. Mm. Mm. Was it according, according to these numbers, virtually every district in the state yeah. is coming up with a reimbursement Sunderland shortfall. doesn't, but Sunderland feeds their kids into Frontier. So ultimately, they're victims of it as well. So what does this mean, reimbursement shortfall? That's another amount of money that we're still not getting back from the original uh, reimbursement formula because we're so underfunded with the old budget. And now the new formula for charters is every year you don't get full reimbursement each right. year. Right. And the governor wanted to even make that a, a, a stricter thing, so by the second year it was chopped. So if you add those two figures together, that's what the towns are losing, the districts are losing. And the, the rural superintendents all got together and they've written several op-eds about so, it. So this is this is what we should be reimbursed, but we're not. Right. And this is... What you're paying out. What, what, what we're paying out. Uh-huh. So even the reimbursement is considerably less than what we're paying out in any case. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But what we're paying out now will be a pittance if we get 12 more charter schools every year because it's written into perpetuity. Right, right. And other states where this has happened, like Louisiana, the entire public school system is a privatized system. And it's a nightmare mm -hmm. because they don't have high quality public education anymore. You know, when you turn on a business channel now, you see the education sector. You never used to see that. That's corporate America figuring out how to take our dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's the standardized testing movement, and you know. And by the way, in terms of test scores, people always harp on this that the charter schools have better MCAS scores and whatever, which is not true. But the single biggest two things that affect your performance in college or in your job later on in life are not your SAT scores or your MCAS scores. They are your zip code and your parents' level of education. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to take a long look at that, too, because we have a system that is really so detrimental to students that are English language learners, students that are disadvantaged in any way. I mean, it's a system that they can never get ahead in. And, you know, I think we're missing a lot of valuable learners and a lot of smart people by not finding other ways to measure what what students do. How big are charter schools? How many kids are involved with charter schools compared to school choice? I don't have that figure, but I, I do know that a lot of districts have been hit hard by school choice, and there have been many uh, school committee meetings that have had lively conversations about whether or not to keep school choice. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're similar in that in school choice, you have a certain number of slots per year, so they, right. you know, they can say there's three slots in third grade, and charters can do the same thing. The other thing is that their lottery system is not transparent. There are no public officials in there when they are selecting students. Now they claim that it's this, you know, blind thing, but you know, they it, it, it looks as if they clearly get some preferred families and kids. Mm. So I, it, I just it, think it's that a blind selection from a preferred. Group. Right, and, and once your sibling is in, you're in. So, mm. 
you know, it's not like public schools. Again, we take everyone. And, and we take kids that really might be struggling in other ways with, you know, we had 75 homeless kids outside the high school that I worked at. I ran the early childhood program in the high school. You know, we have a lot of other issues that are affecting the classroom, right? Sure. Poverty being a huge one. So until we want to take a larger look as a society at funding public education, because it is the only chance kids that live in a marginalized setting have. It's mm -hmm. the only one equalizer. If they get a good education or they bump into a few teachers that really have an impact on them. And I, I know that because it's what I did and it's where I worked. So, and I, I feel lucky that my son got to go to Deerfield and to Frontier because they're excellent schools. Mm -hmm. And I think they're exemplary schools. I mean, schools where you want people to come in and, you know, walk through and see what a great job. I, I subbed in the districts all around here, and I was a permanent sub in, in Waitley and in Sunderland. And I enjoyed it because I get to see all the unbelievably great things public school staff are doing. And, and I mean everyone on the staff, not mm -hmm. just the educators, but the, the ESPs and the paraprofessionals and everyone. So it's, you know, you don't get to do that when you're teaching. And I think for me, it just having the opportunity to have been able to do that just underscores how strongly I feel about this question because... Are, are there polls that how the ballot question is looking? I, they wouldn't really share them with us recently, but what we do know from our polling, from the SOPS campaign polling, is that especially when educators or people that work in schools talk to parents, like I'm talking to you, and spell out the issue, and focus kind of on those three things, the amount of money going out, the lack of local control, the number of students that charter service versus public, and the fact that they're taking this limited subset of people that they hear it. And even people that have had a positive experience, you know, I met uh, two women the other day that were going to send their child to a charter school, and they listened and they pledged to vote no, because they understood what, they, what was at stake mm -hmm. here, you know. How, so, how, does the, how does the average resident get more information about this? You can go, they have a Facebook page and it's all, uh, and their website is on there. And massteacher.org has a section that anyone can go on. You don't have mm -hmm. to be a member of MTA. If you just go on that website, they have a, a, a thing you can click on on the upper left side that says Issues in Action, and you can print out all kinds of information and talking points. And, mm -hmm. and if you want me to get you more materials, I can get them from the campaign. Cause Have, haven't I seen a commercial? Oh. You've seen two. You've seen one that's telling you, not telling you the truth, that's telling you how much money is going to come into public schools if this ballot cap is lifted, if this cap is lifted, which is a blatant lie. <laughs> And the other one that's talking about, that's our end. Right, that's yeah. your end. Right. Okay. Um, I've been canvassing, so this weekend I canvassed 85 houses, and of the people that were home, I had 28 people give me firm vote no's, which is a good percentage. Sure. And only two people say no. And they wouldn't really let me talk about the issue. But And I'm at Farmer's Market every weekend. And I'll be, I'll be doing this till November. I'll be mm -hmm. abandoning my family until November. Because mm -hmm. I really... But from what you say, there's big money behind oh, yeah. pushing the charter school. And it's not yeah. hard to find. There's a professor at UMass that just did a whole thing where he followed it all the way back to the dark money. And he's got, <clears> he's got some of so the... So I expect we'll see a lot of that. Oh, yeah. They have November $18 million dollars to spend. The, these are wealthy people behind this campaign. So, and we have people. Yeah. yeah. So that's now. Now, th <laughs> why do you think, since this seems to be so detrimental financially to the public education system, why are there so many legislators who are for it? Because I think people bite that idea of choice, and they don't want their choice infringed upon, without understanding the larger issue. Okay. And uh, as I said, I'm for choice. The mm -hmm. original idea of charter schools is from a professor at UMass. Mm -hmm who I don't even know if you can find his paper now, and Albert Shanker, who was president of the American Federation sure. of Teachers. Yeah. And that was their idea, to empower teachers to go off and have these innovative satellites and then share the practices with their colleagues. Mm -hmm. So it's morphed into this privatized, corporate-like board. I mean, over 60% of the boards of charter schools have no educators on them. They have mm -hmm. people from the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, these are not the people I want running my school. I would sure. like to know that somebody knows something about education. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So, and the inner city charters have a, a long legacy of really punitive stuff. Like, if they don't want a, a, char a child to stay in the school that they think might be a problem for them, they can demerit them out for really small infractions, like clothing infractions, because mm -hmm. they have uniforms. So, um, you know, there's been a lot written about that. There's tons of research about that. And it's very scholarly, and there's a lot of data. So it's not like, it's not anecdotal by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have a sample resolution in here? I do. Okay. That was one that the school committees passed. And okay. So we were passing these at, like, like at a town meeting? Yeah. The only school committee so far that hadn't done it was Pioneer, and they were having a really big deal end of the year meeting, so they had a lot of pressing agenda items. But, but we did speak at that, which was good because they had a packed house. And Frontier passed it? Frontier, Sunderland, Deerfield, Waitley, Greenfield. So that's mm -hmm. my job after select board meetings as I go to the rest of the yeah. school committee we're, we're most likely going to have a full special town meeting, you think? Uh, it's always possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly we, we, can, we can consider having this on, on the, the warrant mm. for it. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I appreciate okay. your time tonight. Okay. Thank you very much, Diane. Very informative. Thank you. Thank thanks you. for coming thank in. You. James, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Nice Keep something real safe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure, please. Okay. And if you do want more materials, you have my cards. Yes. Yep. Yep. Thank, thank, thank you, Diane. Diane. You're welcome. Have a nice evening. Okay, you too. All right, next item on the agenda is an update from the treasurer, which we're going to table, because our treasurer is not prepared for that. Our next item is the appointment of the assistant to the town administrator. Tom, you want to take it? Uh, this is Rebecca, or I believe maybe Becky Stone. Becky, how are you? John or Robert? You prefer Robert? Yeah, whatever Robert, you prefer. I prefer Robert. 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 Okay, Bob. Right. In front of the camera, he's Robert, and I'm Bob. Right. So we know. Well, here I've been calling you Bob all this time. I'll just call you Robert from now right. on. Okay. <laughs> Robbie. I answer Bob. Bob. <laughs> Tom, you want to take it away? Here? Yeah. Um, as you all know, <clears throat> uh, my assistant Liz uh, Jacobson Carroll has uh, left for a position at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. She uh, ended out the month of July and uh, gave me sufficient notice so I was able to advertise and interview uh, uh, without too much time elapsing, without uh, someone covering uh, her duties specifically. And out of six candidates, um, I am pleased, very pleased to present uh, Rebecca or Becky, perhaps. Yeah, Becky. Uh, Becky uh, Stone, uh, who has worked a lot in municipal administration in Franklin County, including stints as uh, town administrator and town coordinator in Bernardston and Heath, uh, and who is eager to get, come back and do some work in Massachusetts, as I recall. Uh, Hopefully we're closer uh, to wherever you live than Heath. So. Oh, I live in Halifax, so I'm just five, oh. five minutes from the Coleraine line. So, yeah. Still a ways. Yeah. Questions for Becky? Has everybody seen Becky's call? I saw so all the resume in here, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, I'll mention that she was uh, very clearly the most qualified candidate for the position. Okay. And your, your uh, selection committee made a unanimous decision? Yes. Uh, we, all, we all think that Becky uh, is the best candidate. And we look forward to uh, um, the work which we have promised by her, all of her references as being great. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, they were very good references. Okay. okay. Any questions for Becky? Big shoes to fill, we all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, well, she kept we'll, scheduling we'll, that she got to work out with yeah. Tom. Yeah. Uh, Questions you have for us? So keeping, you know, just so that okay. you, the board understands too that you know that I'm keeping the position that I have in Reedsboro. Sure. And that's you know 20 hours, and this is exactly what I was looking to do—something to supplement what I'm doing in Reedsboro. But I miss Massachusetts work. <laughs> just okay. a lot of the same people that you have. You have Joyce here that I know, and Mick mm -hmm. Carroll, and Maya, and a lot of the same sure. names and faces. I just have been on for a few years. So. You have any questions for us, Becky? I think Tom 
has answered all of them. I'm I sure think you've answered, answered all the questions for us, huh? <laughs> all right. <laughs> earlier, <laughs> earlier, <laughs> I think. Yeah. I think there's a, a motion in there that contains all the elements that uh, that we need. We do have this motion right here. Um, if there are no more questions for Becky, I will move uh, to appoint uh, Rebecca Stone as assistant to the town administrator until June 30, 2017, um, subject to completion of physical examination and submission of an I-9 form and the successful completion of a three-month probationary period. Okay. That's do, you have, do you have a second? Do we yeah. have a second? That's the uh, second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, thank you, Becky. Congratulations. Look forward to, to working with you. Thank you very much. Welcome. I feel like I was talking today. I'm very happy that as long as you get along with me. Thank you. Terrific. Thank Have a good you. night, Becky. Yes, too. Gary, how you doing? Great. Come on up into a hot seat yeah. here. Uh, good to see you. Uh, how are you? Hey, Gary. Uh, nice to see you. Nice Bob see you. Perfect timing. Yeah. Hey, it's a bad habit of mine. <laughs> According to some people who don't come on time. <laughs> it's, I have, uh, I'm always on time. It's just... Even when I don't, even running late, I end up being on time. <laughs> well, that's a good. That, that's good. That's good. Well, um, as long as your partner is, goes along with it, which Susan's pretty good at that too. <laughs> yes, yeah, Susan certainly is. Um, let me start off. We we have a letter from um, Mark Silverman, who is the uh, chair of the uh, zoning board of appeals, uh, and he basically says, "I'm requesting that Gary Fenton." Uh, be appointed as the third member of the Conway Zoning Board of Appeals. He comes with great experience and enthusiasm. I am hoping that this appointment can be made and confirmed as soon as possible. I'm the third member of that, I that know. board, so you know we'll have we'll have some some fun together. Um, any questions for Gary? Gary, do you want to say anything to us? Oh, I'm been I've been a resident for well 16 years actually, but we've living for 15 years and I've been on the finance board I, for a couple of years and on the housing committee for a couple of years and I'm working less and I would like to do a little more although I know this isn't a huge job compared to what you guys do but I have a lot of experience in zoning that's good maybe, that too, good. maybe too much actually I, well, I was talking to Mark because I, I know the law <laughs> <laughs> but I do a lot of real estate, a lot of commercial real estate development finance and for many, many, many years. So I know the area. I've done permitting. And Great. So I come with knowledge. I care about the town. I've that's been here for well, quite a while. That, that's a great, great combination. To, not compared to some of you, but yeah. still. Oh, hey. Nice to know that you're up on the rules and regulations and stay on that. Yeah, great. Yeah. Any questions for Gary? Okay. I'll make a motion that uh, Can you do based that? Can on you do that legally being a member of the board. Um, of you know what? Committee? You know what? I'll 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 defer to you, Bob. On I just that. wonder if that's legal. I have no idea. I'll make a motion that we appoint Gary to. I heard so the accused. Mm -hmm. I'll second it. All those in favor? Say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. So Appreciate do I, it. Do I have to get do I, do I get sworn in for this you, job? You, you got to go. Yes. And swear in front of Jenny. Jenny. Yes. Oh, in front of. Or swear at Jenny. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you want to think of. I can. Do, well, you can. You'll notify her first, and obviously. I bet there's no appointment letter for him in there. We will there is. Um, there is no appointment letter in okay. here. Okay. I, I will get Gary. an appointment letter set up. Send so, me an uh, email when you when. Yeah. And then after that, I'll just go. Great. Through. Appreciate that very much. It's a Yeah, it's a really long swearing in ceremony. I know. Did they twist your arm to get you to join us? You must be a friend of ours. Two of our lawyers' friends. Nick Feller and Tom Lesser. Thanks for coming in, Gary. This is not a heavy lifting job. I shouldn't do more. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Have a good night. You too. 
All right, the next item on our agenda is to, uh, to sign the election warrant for the state primary on Thursday, September the 8th. Okay. This is for um, the vote uh, for the 1st Congressional District, the 8th Councilor District, the um, Berkshire, Hampshire, Franklin, and Hamden District, that's the State Senate, uh, representative in the General Court for the 1st Franklin District, and the Sheriff of Franklin County. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion that we. So they don't list the governor's council, or was that one of those that. Councilor. Right? The councilor. Yeah. Yeah. Eighth, okay, eighth yeah. councilor district. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion that we sign the uh, warrant as prepared by our town administrator for the state uh, primary on the 8th of September. Second it. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And that's the that election is on a Thursday, which is really unusual. Yes, Thursday. Yeah. Well, they wanted to make sure people were back from Labor Day weekend. I guess so. You know? I don't ever remember an election on a Thursday. My next item on the agenda was to consider a request from the town of Shelburne to contribute to the Solarize legal fees. That matter has apparently been settled and will be done through Solarize Mass, so that's tabled. Uh, the South River project, um, there's an update. Tom, do you want to give us a short update on that? Yeah, uh, work has actually started on that. Uh, just very preliminary work, uh, some uh, treating of uh, invasives, invasive species that are there. Uh, we're currently um, waiting for a uh, contract amendment. They have to stop the field work by October 1st, and the way the contract was written, the project had to be completed by October 3rd, 1st, but they very reasonably pointed out that there's a lot of follow-up paperwork that they could easily do shortly thereafter. So we're waiting to find out what their timeline is for that, uh, because they also don't want to wait too long before getting their retainage. So we're just waiting for uh, that um, them to tell us what dates they would prefer to have to do the paperwork with the understanding that it's not going to be a long period of time, but a relatively short period of time. So I'll probably have that contract for you at your next meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. In the meantime, uh, the Conservation Commission has given the go-ahead for them to start the work, so that uh, that should be proceeding. Right, okay. And we had we were scheduled to sign that, that amendment or contract tonight, but we're tabling that until they come up with... If that uh, contract yeah. comes in sooner, I guess we probably could sign it to not hold the project at all. Sooner than we have to. Yeah, I think that I think we're closing in on October pretty fast. Mm -hmm. It's true, and they do need a 30-day <coughs> mobilization. Um, that that's what they're counting on. So, in in theory, the the next meeting would still give them plenty okay. of time. I'll will see when I get something back if, from them. If if you we will give them as much time as they want. If we can have a, an emergency meeting, or or a, a meeting that's properly noticed before yeah. the next meeting, we'll. we'll We'll do that. Sure, that's to that's sign true. that contract. Okay. Uh, okay. Next item is to approve text for public service announcements to be mailed with the September tax bills. We have not received anything on that, so that's going to be tabled. Uh, next item is employee recognition for Leland Gray Transfer Station. Uh, Leland does a great job at the it's transfer good. station, and um, I'll make uh, I'll make a motion that we uh, sign this letter of five-year service to Leland. Do second. I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Good employee. He enjoys his work too. He does. He really does. <laughs> He's always very helpful. Yeah. That seems to be a real change this year. Pull in the transfer station. They leap out. Yeah, really, really very nice people. Yeah. There. Oh, yeah. Okay, Tom, um, we have any items not anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Tom, you have an update for us? Yes, I do. That. Uh, Robert had already uh, mentioned that uh, there is some land for sale in the center of the town, um, and I do not have the handout for you, 
uh, but it's there. There are several parcels that might be involved near the uh, corner of Academy Hill Road and Maple Street. Um, the planning board has had a preliminary conversation with the owners, along with representatives from the Public Safety Services Housing Committee and Select Board. Um, and Bob was there, and uh, and staff. Um, I'm getting additional details from the administrative assessor and hope to have a presentation for you soon. Um, for departmental work, uh, fiscal year 2017 free cash has been certified at $205,332. That's um, what, about 40000 more than, than originally? Yeah, than last what? year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what... Uh what happened with that? I think it was uh, the mild winter, um, and okay. which which left some fuel costs unspent and some highway costs unspent. Even though we moved forty two thousand over, that wasn't right. all they had in their winter budget, and uh, that's um, that's probably a good good portion of that. Uh, we are working to have the tax rate set. I know uh, Lee was over in the assessor's office. Uh, waiting for a phone call this morning to see okay. whether or not she could post the, uh, the review period. Okay. Uh, and it, just as soon as she can do that, uh, she will. And uh, we do hope to have the tax rate set by the end of the month. Great. Okay. Good. Uh, in other news, the farmer's market uh, has moved to the bank yeah. parking lot. Uh, we'll see whether that experiment gets them more uh, traffic. Uh, was 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 the reason for the move that they thought it would be give more exposure? Think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Tough find people finding place to park. Well, it's down good here parking yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, That's already, a good idea. <clears throat> I already spoke about the South River project, and uh, just a note that the Franklin Land Trust is sponsoring a bike ride on Saturday, August twentieth, and we'll be using the ball field as a watering station. I can kind of set up a table there. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, concerns of our selectmen. Do we have any concerns? No. No, no. no concerns tonight. No Hearing concerns. none, we'll move on to mail. Okay, in the mail we received um, a uh, handout from Solarized Mass. Uh, as you know, Bryce Herford uh, from Conway is our solar coach, and we've gotten an extremely good response to their um, advertising for um, solarized mass. We have, what, about 80 residents that have been interested? Yes. Okay, and that the sign-up ends on September the 30th, so anyone who is still interested should see Bryce. Uh, and do we have it? We have his number on the website, don't we? Uh, do we? I will make sure it mm -hmm. is. Okay, yeah, put something out there on that. Um, and we have a local installer, uh, the, the solar store of Greenfield will be doing the installations. So it's, it's good to see that uh, uh, they're right up in Greenfield. Okay. And again, that the sign-up deadline for that is September 30th. We also have a mail from uh, Clearing the Way Invasions, Invasive Species Removal. Uh, There's a demonstration uh, that will be done on September the 11th, that's a Sunday from 4 to 5.30, at the Rose Field in the center of Conway. Uh, and that will be a demonstration by naturalist Lori Sanders, if anyone is interested in that. Okay, anybody have any announcements? No? no? Okay. Uh, okay, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, August the 22nd at 7 o'clock here in the town offices, unless we have a meeting sooner to sign the, the Davenport contract. Okay. Uh, and right now, do we need to have an executive session? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Okay, we'll go into executive session for uh, reason number two, to conduct negotiating sessions with non-union personnel. I don't think we have to go into it for those other reasons that we have listed mm -hmm. here at this point. Right. Um, we have a roll call vote, Bob. And, and, and that would be a, a motion to go into it and to adjourn, adjourn immediately. Immediately, without coming yeah. into an open session. Yeah. Bob? So, yep. Yes. Bob? Yes. Robert? Yes. And me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dan.